So yes, I'm going to talk about some issues in middle and late Pleistocene human evolution. And uh, certainly there are, there's plenty of material I could talk about. So I'm having to limit what I'm talking about to just a few topics in this area. So what I'm going to talk about today is first of all, I'm going to look at the Denisovans, people we've only learnt about in the last 10 years or so. I'm going to talk about Homo sapiens origins and early dispersals of Homo sapiens from Africa. I'm going to look at the uh, perennial question of whether the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens are distinct species. And finally, if there's time, look at the question of how Homo sapiens succeeded, if we can call it success, uh, while other human groups went extinct. So, as most of you know, I'm sure, uh, we've got this diversity in human evolution, and that diversity even comes into the last 100,000 years or so. So about 70,000 years ago, there were at least five kinds of humans around on the earth. We had been evolving in Africa. The Neanderthals had been evolving in Europe and Asia. The Denisovans were present in East Asia. And over on the islands of Southeast Asia, we had these strange small-bodied species, Homo floresiensis on the island of Flores in Indonesia, and Homo luzonensis in the Philippines. So at least five kinds of humans, and indeed Homo erectus, some of us think that might still have been around as well. So at least five kinds of humans, 70,000 years ago. And then when we get to 30,000 years ago, as far as we know, all of those other forms of humans had gone physically extinct. All trace of them disappears from the fossil and archeological record. We were the only ones left. So there was a major changeover and I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. So here's a representation of this diversity of the last 1 million years from a paper I did in 2019 with Julia Galway Rittam and James Cole. Um, and uh, it reviews some of the data at least for this one million year period. And at the top there, you can see this great diversity of lineages, species, if we want to call them that, some of them certainly. Um, and I'm going to concentrate on the last 500,000 years or so in this presentation. So first of all, let's look at this question of the nature of the last common ancestor of Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens. So for a long time, certainly more than 30 years, I had the view that uh, we could identify this common ancestor, probably in the fossil record, as this species Homo heidelbergensis. So for me, Homo heidelbergensis is a widespread species. It exists in Europe, in Africa, in Asia. And I thought potentially it formed a reasonable common ancestor for us and the Neanderthals. So for example, in the face, I saw the Homo heidelbergensis face as being sort of intermediate in shape between the two rather different facial shapes we find in Neanderthals and in modern humans. So in the Neanderthals, the middle of the face is pulled strongly forwards, particularly the nasal area. The cheekbones are rather inflated. And in modern humans, we have a much transversely flatter face with rather hollowed cheekbones. So my view was that heidelbergensis could be an intermediate sort of between those two conditions and evolution went in two different directions after Heidelbergensis to evolve the Neanderthal face and the modern human face. So here is that view represented in a diagram with uh, the earlier species Homo antecessor down there as a potential side branch of early human evolution and then later on the diversification of the Neanderthals, Denisovans and Homo sapiens from this supposed ancestor Homo heidelbergensis. But uh, recent data certainly is building up to suggest that that view is certainly doubtful and, and, and potentially wrong. So when we look at earlier forms in the fossil record, ones that are earlier than some of the heidelbergensis fossils, uh, we can look for example at the uh, face here of Homo antecessor from Grandolina, um, at a Puerca in Spain, dated to about 850,000 years old. This is an immature individual, 
but the facial shape looks much more like that of a modern human than does the face of, of a typical Heidelbergensis. And on the right hand side, we've got a slide of the, uh, the Nanjing Hulu cave skull from China, perhaps 600,000 years old. That too has a facial shape that's more like that of Homo sapiens than is the typical Homo heidelbergensis face. So my view had been that, uh, let's say for Homo antecessor, if we had a bigger sample of Homo antecessor uh, and also older individuals, more mature individuals, they might look more like heidelbergensis. But in fact, we have several facial fragments from Grandolina now. All of them show this rather modern looking facial morphology. Um, and some of them are older individuals. So it looks like this is the sort of morphology that's around at the beginning of the middle Pleistocene, at least in some parts of the world. And when we go on in time a bit to look at later Chinese fossils, and I've got examples here in this picture from Dali and Harbin, we can see that these later Chinese fossils also have a facial shape that's uh, more like that of modern humans than the typical Heidelbergensis shape. And at the bottom of this slide, we have an example of Heidelbergensis, Broken Hill, and we have an early Neanderthal from the Cima de los Huesos, and that shows a face which looks different again to the modern human face. And we know that that Atapuerca sample from the Cima de los Huesos is about 430,000 years old. And yet these individuals show Neanderthal features uh, in several parts of their anatomy, particularly the teeth, the middle of the face starts to show some Neanderthal features. And genetically, we know from ancient DNA that this SEMA sample also seems to lie on the Neanderthal lineage and uh, not even at the beginning of the lineage. In morphology and DNA, uh, the SEMA material seemed to be some way down the Neanderthal lineage. And in addition, uh, I was involved in dating one of the most famous Homo heidelbergensis specimens, this skull from Broken Hill in Zambia. And this is a paper from earlier in the year from Nature. And we estimated the age of this fossil at about 299,000 years. So about 300,000 years old. And yet it's a heidelbergensis actually later than the Sema people, later than some of those other fossils I've shown you, still showing the heidelbergensis morphology no sign here of any change towards a modern human facial shape. So all of this is making me rethink my view. And we can see in the middle of this diagram here, the representation of the SEMA fossils as being well down the Neanderthal lineage. They're not at the beginning of it. That suggests the Neanderthal lineage had deeper roots, perhaps 600,000 years ago. And also, on the diagram on the right, we can see now the evidence that Heidelbergensis is surviving longer in the fossil record. So this suggests to me that the ancestor must have lived further back and the ancestor had a facial shape that was more like Homo antecessor and more like those early Chinese fossils than it was like Heidelbergensis fossils. So I've called on the right hand diagram here, this ancestor is ancestor X. We haven't identified it yet, but in some ways, for example, in the facial shape, it might well have looked more like Homo antecessor. So let's move on to the next question about the Denisovans. Who were the Denisovans and how do they fit into human evolution? Well, of course, the Denisova cave was under excavation for many years by Russian archaeologists and they had found fragmentary human fossils. But it wasn't until 2010 with ancient DNA work that it became clear that these represented a distinct kind of human that we now know as Denisovans, perhaps an early offshoot of the Neanderthal lion. And the DNA evidence suggests that this population of Denisovans existed in Denisova cave probably for at least 100 or 150,000 years. So a long occupation of the site in Denisova cave by these Denisovans and uh, even evidence that Neanderthals were at the site as well some of the time. So two potentially two human populations occupying Denisova cave over tens of thousands of years. But the physical evidence of the Denisovans is very limited. And in the top of this diagram, we can see the evidence we've got for the Denisovans, um, uh, a finger bone, uh, some tooth fragments. There is now some fragmentary cranial material from Denisova cave that is Denisovan. 
And we actually have Neanderthal fossils, uh, and in fact, although they're fragmentary too, there are actually more Neanderthal fossils from Denisova Cave than there are Denisovans. And there's even what seems to be a first generation hybrid between a Neanderthal and a Denisovan parent. This fragmentary fossil, Denisova 11, uh, nicknamed Denny. So a complex site with an occupation by at least two forms of humans, and later on, at the top of the stratigraphy, occupation by Homo sapiens. And recent work also suggests that this jawbone from the Tibetan plateau of China, from Xiaohei, uh, from Baixia Cave, uh, is probably also Denisovan too. So it's a very robust jawbone, very large teeth, which in that way resemble the ones from Denisova, and fragmentary bits of genetic material of proteins suggest that this fossil is probably on the Denisovan lineage. And to confirm that in a way, there's also Denisovan DNA from the cave sediments. So mitochondrial DNA of the Denisovan lineage has now been recovered from cave sediments in the Baishia cave in the Tibetan Plateau. So it looks like Denisovans were there on the Tibetan Plateau at least over a hundred thousand year period. And this jawbone may well represent a Denisovan. So when we look at the Denisovan teeth and the uh, teeth in that Jiahe jawbone um, and compare them with Neanderthals, what we can say is that, let's say the Sima del Huesos teeth that we know about very well, there are hundreds of Neanderthal teeth from Neanderthal-like teeth from the Sima del Huesos. So those teeth from the Sima, which are dated at about 430,000 years, look very Neanderthal-like. If we look at the Denisovan teeth, there are few, if any, Neanderthal features in those teeth. They're very large, very complex, very complex roots. And in that way, they're, they're very unlike the Neanderthals. So there doesn't seem to be any Neanderthal affinity there in the dental remains. And this suggests that the Denisovan lineage must have split off pretty early from the Neanderthal lineage. As I say here, because of a more primitive mandibular and dental morphology, the Denisovan lineage probably diverged from the Neanderthal lineage prior to the time of the SEMA sample and that would be then more than 430,000 years ago, that divergence of the Denisovans from the Neanderthal lineage. And uh, if we look at other fossils that might be Denisovan, well, um, in China, of course, we've got a range of fossils with uncertain affinities. Uh, there's Marpa, uh, there's the Pengu mandible from uh, found off the coast of Taiwan. Fossils such as Yu Jiao Yao, Harbin and Dali, and from India, of course, we have the enigmatic Namada fossil from the Middle Pleistocene. So could these be Denisovans? Well, what we can say is that at least on the present data, Marpa looks maybe more like an early Neanderthal in terms of its brow ridge and, uh, and skull shape, but it's very fragmentary. The Pengu mandible, that does resemble the jawbone from Jahe, and so this could well be a Denisovan. Zhu Jiao Yao certainly has large and complex teeth, maybe a Denisovan. Dali and Harbin, perhaps they're Denisovans. Namada, maybe they're Denisovans, but unfortunately we'd have to say, until we have more complete uh, fossil material of the Denisovans from Denisova Cave or Ziahe, or until we have DNA from some of these fossils or, or protein material, it's very difficult to be sure that many of them are Denisovans. They may be, but we have to keep an open mind on this and await further research developments and discoveries. But what we do know about the Denisovans also is that their DNA lives on in many modern humans in Eastern Asia and Southeast Asia. And this is best explained by interbreeding with a Denisovan-like population or maybe more than one Denisovan population in Asia and Southeast Asia. So the suggestion would be that as modern humans emerge from Africa after 60,000 years ago, they first of all encountered Neanderthals in Western Asia and there was some interbreeding and that DNA was taken with those modern humans as they spread out further east. And then somewhere down in Southeast Asia, uh, there was interbreeding with Denisovans down there and that was taken towards Australia and New Guinea uh, where we find quite high levels of Denisovan DNA today in those populations. So populations in Asia and Southeast Asia 
have evidence of at least two interbreeding events. The first one, a Neanderthal one, and the second one, a Denisovan one. Both of those calculated by geneticists to have occurred after 60,000 years ago. So we can build up a network, a, quite a complex network now of Denisovan relationships. So this map shows you the Denisova cave itself, and we can make a link with the fossil material, as we mentioned, from Jiahe in China, uh, through dental morphology and proteomics, and also the mitochondrial DNA in the Baishia cave itself. Potentially links with fossils like Pengu, uh, in terms of the resemblance to the Jiahe mandible. Um, and then when we turn to the data for modern humans, we've got evidence in Tibet, for example, that there's a gene there, which is Denisovan-like and which helps some Tibetan populations adapt to life at high altitudes. Um, and then down in Southeast Asia, we have these slightly higher levels of Denisovan DNA at the level of maybe three or 4%, uh, which seems to have come from interbreeding in that region of Southeast Asia and high levels of Denisovan DNA found in regions like Papua New Guinea and Australia. So in terms of judging where those southern Denisovans might have lived, the ones who put their DNA into the ancestors of uh, people like New Guineans and Australian Aborigines, um, we know, of course, that uh, Erectus was uh, a long-lived lineage uh, on Java. Homo floresiensis is on Flores. Homo luzinensis is, is there in the Philippines. So my guess, and it can only be a guess until we have better data, is that these southern Denisovans perhaps lived in this region from Sumatra, Borneo, maybe Sulawesi. This is where I would guess that those southern Denisovans may have been living. So now let's turn our attention to Homo sapiens and we look at the origins of Homo sapiens and early dispersers of Homo sapiens from Africa. So of course we've got uh, new data from the site of Jebel Ikhud in Morocco. So the site first worked, worked on and published in the 1960s. And there was a skull uh, pictured on the bottom left there. Uh, a skull had been found and originally had been called an African Neanderthal. But in fact, it doesn't look much like Neanderthal, certainly in its face. It's got a face that looks more like a modern human. Um, so new excavations and new dating work has been conducted. And we can see here, um, some of the beautiful archaeology from the site, uh, Middle Stone Age archaeology on, on the right hand side there, and new fossil finds being made, including a jawbone, which you can see articulated on the bottom left there with the Jebelihood one skull. We have the new jawbone from Jebelihood. And this material was published uh, three years ago in Nature as being early Homo sapiens at about 300,000 years from Morocco. So it's a wonderful fossil material. And so here's a representation then of where we might place that Jebelihood fossil in terms of evolution of Homo sapiens. So on the left-hand side there, we have the evolution of the Neanderthal lineage, and we've got the Cimadol Huesos people represented there as early Neanderthals, potentially at about 400,000 years. And on the right-hand side, we have the Jebelihood fossil represented as a potentially an early Homo sapiens at about 300,000 years. But on the other hand, when we look at the African pattern as a whole, we see a lot of variation between about 100 and 300,000 years ago. It's difficult to discern a clear pattern of change through time from uh, archaic humans to modern humans. So modern human features appear, but they appear rather sporadically. Uh, they appear in, in different regions at different times. They come together by 100,000 years ago in fossils like the ones from Shkul and Kafse in Israel, which are pictured on the bottom right there. But before that, we have this rather scattered appearance of what we can call Homo sapiens features. And even a fossil like Jebelihud, some work suggests that uh, although its face looks rather modern, like the brain case was still primitive and, and even Neanderthal-like in some respects in this fossil from about 300,000 years ago. And we have to remember that our fossil record still comes from less than 10% of the area of the African continent. Uh, we have the wonderful sites in the rift valleys of East Africa. We have the cave sites of Southern Africa. Uh, we have the cave sites of places like Morocco, but in between there's vast areas of Africa 
where we know people lived from archaeology, from the stone tools, but we actually have no evidence of what those people looked like. And of course, as I've already mentioned, we know that uh, Homo hardibagensis in the form of the Broken Hill Skull was probably still around in uh, South Central Africa about 300,000 years ago uh, in Zambia. And not only that, we've also learned in the last few years this remarkable, about this remarkable species Homo naledi, showing many primitive features, still with a very small brain, some primitive features in the shoulders and, uh, and unusual features in the, in the body. This species present apparently around 300,000 years ago down in South Africa. So this is very surprising because we would have had the view until recently that uh, 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens should have been evolving in various parts of Africa. And instead we see that we've got, yes, maybe evidence of early Homo sapiens in the north, but in South Central Africa, possibly Homo is still surviving. And down in South Africa, this strange species, Homo naledi, uh, present at this time. So a much more complex picture. We have a bit more certainty probably about some modern human features being there by about 200,000 years ago. And this comes from the Homo kibish one skeleton. So this skeleton was found in the 1960s, uh, but recent work suggests that it's probably around 196,000 years old. And not only that, more parts of that skeleton have been found that really do show that it's a modern human, not only in the skull form, it's got a high and rounded cranial vault, it's got a chin on the front of that jawbone, but the pelvis, for example, does show modern human features. So if I had to say, where was the oldest modern human uh, globally, I would say at the moment, the best evidence for it is at Omo Kibish, um, the fossil, the skeleton Omo one, is probably the oldest modern human that we can really be reasonably confident about in the fossil record at about 195,000 years old. And there's an emerging view that the evolution of uh, Homo sapiens in Africa was a complex process. Uh, and this is a uh, work of Eleanor Sherry and colleagues, and I've been involved in some of this work. And here's a quote uh, from Ellie here. Humans did not stem from a single ancestral population in one region of Africa, as is often claimed. Instead, our African ancestors were diverse in form and culture and scattered across the entire continent. So down on the bottom right there, you can see a representation of the evolution of the modern human lineage in Africa. So we've got several lineages which were evolving in different parts of Africa. Now and again, they come together and exchange genes and ideas. Um, and sometimes they're separated from each other by, by severe climatic changes. Uh, other times they're brought together and exchange genes. So this network of evolving populations is the one that gave rise to Homo sapiens in Africa by about 100,000 years ago in terms of the consolidation of those modern human features. So what about the exit of modern humans from Africa and, and how many were there? Well, uh, until recently, some people argued there really was only one exit of modern humans, probably around 60,000 years ago. But the picture has got much more complex than that. So some exits were after 60,000, but are relatively early. So we know now that modern humans were in parts of Eastern Europe by about 45,000 years ago from this uh, wonderful new evidence from the Bachukuro site in Bulgaria, uh, published in Nature uh, not long ago. And there's potentially even older evidence of Homo sapiens, much older evidence from the site of Epidemo Cave in Greece. So I've been involved in this work uh, led by Katerina Havati. And the Epidemo site um, has actually two human fossils that were found close together in a breccia. But the interesting thing is that we can date them as being distinct in age um, and also they're distinct in their morphology. So the second skull, Epidemo II, is certainly Neanderthal-like. And that's about 170,000 years old. But found close to it, but quite distinct from it, we've got the Epidema 1 fossil. And the Epidema 1 fossil is dated at over 200,000 years old. And it shows, in our view, quite a distinct morphology. So I've got a representation here on the bottom of this slide of the back of the Epidema skull. That's all that's preserved of Epidema 1. 
and it really does look like a modern human fossil in terms of the shape of the back of the skull. So we're comparing it here with a Neanderthal, a typical Heidelbergensis, and with a Homo sapiens, and the closest resemblance in our analyses of the back of that skull was to the early modern human fossil of School 5 from Israel, uh, which is depicted here on the bottom right of this slide. So evidence then apparently of an early exit of Homo sapiens from Africa getting at least to Eastern Europe uh, by over 200,000 years ago. And in fact, that does match with some recent interpretations of the genetic data. So some of this is coming through now to suggest that there were some interbreeding events between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals that occurred before 200,000 years ago. So this is shown particularly in changes in the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome DNA of Neanderthal populations. And as it says here, uh, there was gene flow from Homo sapiens to Neanderthals probably between two to 300,000 years ago. And so possibly this Apidema 1 fossil is a representative of a population that may have been exchanging DNA with in uh, regions actually outside of Africa more than 200,000 years ago. And when we go further east, we can see other evidence of apparently the early appearance of Homo sapiens before 60,000 years ago. So from southern China, there are teeth which seem to be modern human that are more than 80,000 years old. In Sumatra, potentially some modern human teeth that are about 70,000 years old. And of course, the remarkable evidence from Majibebe in Australia, this rock shelter has a very deep stratigraphy and there's complex technology and uh, extensive use of pigments preserved down to depths of about 65,000 years ago. We assume this is modern humans and therefore a modern human arrival in Australia, certainly more than 60,000 years ago. So how do we make sense of this data? Well, I've adapted this diagram from uh, a piece by Robin Dennell, but perhaps there were at least two waves of humans moving eastwards towards uh, Asia and Southeast Asia. A first wave, at least 100,000 years ago, did spread down Southeast Asia. The main wave, the second wave, about 60,000 years ago followed on. And we'd have to argue that that second wave must have overprinted any genetic trace of those earlier populations. Because most geneticists uh, argue that from genomic DNA, mitochondrial DNA, and white chromosome DNA, modern humans outside of Africa trace almost all of their origins to this exit that happened after 60,000 years ago. And that period after 60,000 years ago is also the period when the interbreeding with Neanderthals and Denisovans occurred. So let's return now to that question of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. Are they good species? And uh, I, I regard them as species. Well, if we look at the skeleton, biologically, I think it's, it's clear that, that using the standards we apply to other mammals, for example, to other primates, then certainly there's enough evidence in the skeletons of modern humans and Neanderthals to make us distinct species. So for example, we have a differently shaped rib cage. We have a differently shaped pelvis. In the skull, there's a range of features which differentiate us. For example, this uh, globular brain case, a weak brow ridge, uh, a strong chin at the front of the jaw. We have distinctive ear bone shapes. We have a narrow base to the skull. Uh, these features come together to make a distinct anatomical pattern that suggests that Homo sapiens is a distinct species from Homo neanderthalensis. And yet there was interbreeding and there's no doubt it happened. And this is the, uh, the famous revelation of this uh, interbreeding from about two, from 2010, a paper in Science. As it says here, the long awaited sequence of the Neanderthal genome suggests that modern humans and Neanderthals interbred tens of thousands of years ago, perhaps in the Middle East. As a result, most people living outside Africa have inherited a small but significant amount of DNA from these extinct humans. So how can we have a distinct species and yet interbreeding? Well, I think if you ask most workers in biology generally, uh, that's not a big surprise. So here's a paper from a few years back, hybridization, integration, and the nature of species boundaries. And as it says here, um, 
you know, recent data from DNA sequences and genotypes reinforce earlier conclusions about the semi-permeable nature of most species boundaries. And indeed, there's a paper by Ottenbergs and co, which suggests that about 16% of closely related bird species are documented to have hybridized with at least one other bird species in nature. So interbreeding between closely related species is actually very common in nature. Um, so we shouldn't be surprised if it was occurring between closely related human species. So I've written a, a piece about this on the uh, Natural History Museum website. Uh, our Neanderthals are the same species as us, and I would refer you to it. And I've got a quote from it here. In my view, if Neanderthals and Homo sapiens remain separate long enough to evolve such distinctive skull shapes, rib cages, pelvises, and ear bones, they can be regarded as different species, interbreeding or not, similar behaviors or not. Humans are great classifiers and we do like to keep things orderly, but we should not be surprised when the natural world, past and present, does not match up to our neat and simple schemes. So I think we can have both. We can have Neanderthals as a closely related species, but a distinct species, even with some interbreeding, even with some shared behaviours. So let's return to that big question now, one of the biggest questions of uh, this diversity in humans that we can see even 70,000 years ago, a number of different species or lineages around the, uh, the world. But when we get to 30,000 years ago, apparently all of those others have disappeared, at least physically. Of course, we know that bits of Neanderthal and bits of Denisovan live on in us, in our genomes, but physically, as far as we know, those other species had disappeared by about 30,000 years ago. And why was that? Well, there are many ideas. Uh, I would say we still don't really know, but certainly one thing that's come through recently has been emphasized is the, the differences in things like the ribcage shape between Homo sapiens and earlier human species, such as Homo erectus and the Neanderthals. So, uh, for example, here's a quote saying, we found that Neanderthals presented around 20% larger lung capacities than modern humans, both absolutely and relative to their mass and stature. This could be caused by the lean body mass of Neanderthals, coupled with their large brains and guts, which contributed to their high energy use. So were we perhaps simply a more efficient model of human that used less resources, and therefore on any given landscape, there could be more modern humans supported on the landscape than you could support a Homo erectus or a Neanderthal population. So were we simply a more efficient kind of human? That's certainly a possibility. <clears throat> here are some other views that I've uh, culled from the, uh, the literature. Um, so here's some quotes. Homo sapiens were to blame for Neanderthal extinction because they were better hunters and outcompeted them for food, a computer model shows. Uh, another quote, climate change likely iced the Neanderthals out of existence. Uh, another quote, humans replaced Neanderthals because we had bows and arrows and they didn't, a study suggests. And down the bottom right there, Homo sapiens developed a new ecological niche that separated it from other hominins. So a number of different views there. Uh, one of the most recent, and I think one of the most unlikely, is the idea that we actually went to war with the Neanderthals. Here's a quote, war in the time of Neanderthals, how our species battled for supremacy for over 100,000 years. Uh, very dramatic and uh, I'm afraid uh, uh, overinterpreted from the data, uh, in my view. So, uh, a little bit more sensible, I think, Robin Dennell's view um, here, uh, this is from his recent book. In summary, we succeeded in colonizing all parts of Asia and in eliminating rival species, such as the Neanderthals, because we were more numerous, we had a more diverse diet that increased the survival rates of mothers and infants, and we combined a longer period of childhood development with a reorganized brain that was cognitively more powerful, inventive, imaginative, and ingenuous at colonizing new environments. So a combination of features for, for Robin Dennell, and I certainly think it wasn't down to one thing, it probably was a combination of factors that allowed us uh, to survive, uh, potentially at the expense of some of those other species that we were competing with for resources in the same areas. And uh, 
quite a nice view, I think, that's coming through now, Survival of the Friendliest. So this is from, uh, excerpted from a book by Brian Hare and Vanessa Woods. As humans became friendlier, we were able to make the shift from living in small bands of 10 to 15 individuals to living in larger groups of 100 or more. Even without larger brains, our larger, better coordinated groups easily outcompeted other groups of humans. I wouldn't say necessarily easily, but anyway. Our sensitivity to others allowed us to cooperate and communicate in increasingly complex ways that put our cultural abilities on a new trajectory. We could innovate and share those innovations more rapidly than anyone else. So I think this is a, this is a nice idea too. So I'll just summarize uh, what, I, what I've concluded really as much as I can conclude on this talk. So first of all, on the question of the last common ancestor of uh, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, I'm increasingly doubtful that it was Hydabagensis. It probably wasn't Hydabagensis, and I think it's currently uncertain what that common ancestor looked like and, and where it lived. It may have lived in Africa, it may have lived in Europe, it may have lived in Asia. I don't think we know. So who were the Denisovans? Well, they were a separate Asian lineage, probably a different species. If the Neanderthals are a different species with that amount of time of evolution, probably the Denisovans would turn out to be a distinct species as well, once we know more about them. About Homo sapiens origins and early dispersals from Africa, well, as I've said, it's probably a complex origin in Africa, not in one time and place, as we may have believed. And there were several dispersals of Homo sapiens from Africa, even if it's only the dispersal at about 60,000 years that left its major mark on humanity today. Are Neanderthals and Homo sapiens good species? Biologically, I would say yes, but I certainly don't get, try not get hung up on this question. It's not actually a very big deal whether they're dis called distinct species or not. The important thing is to look at their evolutionary history uh, and the development of their features through that time. And why did Homo sapiens succeed while other human groups went extinct? Well, I think it was a combination of factors and these seem to have mostly operated after 45,000 years ago because those earlier dispersals of Homo sapiens that seem to have happened um, 100,000 years ago, potentially even 200,000 years ago, um, those did not lead to the replacement of those other humans outside of Africa. It's only the dispersal after 60,000 that seems to have had that effect of, of removing, of supplanting those other species of humans through some mechanism or other. So I'm going to stop there and thank you all for listening. And I'd like to thank, of course, the place I've worked for so many years, the Natural History Museum for, for, in London for giving me a home for so many years. I'd like to thank the Kaliva Foundation and the Human Origins Research Fund for supporting my work. And I'd like to thank all my sources of data and illustrations. Um, and there are a few books of mine that you could look at if you want some more information. And also, of course, you can find me on Twitter if you look on Twitter, at Chris Stringer 65. So thank you for listening and I'll stop there. <laughs>